Well, you know, today we hear a story of a man who saw by hearing. A man who saw by hearing. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing from the Word of God. But, of course, faith is a, a way of seeing. It's a way of knowing. And sometimes in our language, in fact, often, we refer to the word seeing not just as something that happens with our physical eyes, but something that happens with that internal thing that we call insight. So I'll be saying something, whatever you say, ah, I see. And that basically doesn't mean that photons are hitting your light, your retina. It means that, that something lit up in your mind, see? So what we want to do, in fact, I just did it there, see? Do you see? All right. All right. So we have then this, um, this call to learn to see by hearing, not simply by what our physical eyes uh, can see. So let's talk today about a man who uh, saw by hearing. Now, this Bartimaeus, who is a historical figure, lived some 2,000 and some years ago, in a town called Jericho. But Bartimaeus is not just locked away in history. His story is our story because we too are blind. We too struggle to see. And only, ultimately, only the Lord can enlighten us. You can go to the ophthalmologist. You can go to the optometrist. You can go get these things. I love my glasses. Without them, all I see are shapes out there. You're all a bunch of shapes, you know. Put these on, I can see. But there's an inner seeing that really the Lord has to give to us. With that in mind, let's follow then Bartimaeus in his journey so that we can follow our own journey. The first stage of his journey is that there is a problem that is perceived, but only partially. Hmm? There is a perception or a partial perception of a problem. Bartimaeus has one thing going for him. He knows he's blind. He can't see. And so he knows this about himself. But the question for you and me is, do we know that? You know, it's too easy for us to become very smug and think, well, oh, I know a few things, and we have strong opinions. Oh, the, oh, oh. You know, we, have, we think we know all the facts. We think we know what we know because, after all, I know it. I heard it on... I don't know, fill in the blank, CNN, MSNBC, Fox, whatever. I, I saw it there, I know. And this is what you, you know. And so we get very certain about our views. And um, I do not cast aspersions on everybody's views, but at the end of the day, our, we have to accept that our view is limited. We don't know all the details. I don't know about you, but I've unfortunately had the experience of being reported on. <laughs> <laughs> or something in the church that was reported on. And I, I mean, they got so much wrong. They got so many facts just wrong. And so again, we tend to take this attitude that I know what's really going on, and I can see it all. And we cop an attitude, and we think this. But not only that, that's not as... That's, that's, that's about worldly things, but we also cop an attitude with God. Why doesn't God do it this way? He should do it this way. Come on, God, hurry up. Do this, do that. And we, before you know it, we, we, we think we know more than God does. We think we see more than he does. And we should go before God with great humility, and we'll see as the story unfolds, there are some reasons that God delays. I, I won't give them, I, I don't want to anticipate another part of the homily, but just to say that there are, there are just things we don't see that God does. And yet even there, we want to tell God what to do. Here's the agenda. I want this. I need that right away. Okay. And there's nothing wrong with praying about that and asking. Nothing. But the attitude that we take if he doesn't give it to us just the way we think he should, or not just us, but he should deal with the world this way. We need more signs and wonders, you know, whatever we think we know better than God, see? 
And this is how we can be. I don't say this of everybody here equally or in the same way, but this is a human tendency, isn't it? So at least Bartimaeus knows he's blind. Do we know that we're blind? Just two more things to say about this. There is nothing, we're surrounded by angels and demons too, but angels who outnumber the demons, thank you, Jesus. Do we see them? No. No. Or God is more present to you are than, than you are to yourself. Do you see him? No. You see everything else but God. And we think we see everything. And so these are just some, some calls for humility. Now, there is something about Bartimaeus then who is in some ways better off than we are. At least he knows he's blind. And the question for us in all humility is, do we know that there is much that we do not see and cannot see, but are called to, in stages, learn to see, if nothing else, through humility? Now, the second aspect, though, of his problem is that, that, that we might share in common with him, which is this. He sees, but his, his perception isn't complete because, you know, he jangles the cup. He, any, every passerby, anybody, somebody can help me, anybody, any passerby. Okay, so we seek help as we should from doctors, lawyers, tax consultants, other HVAC people, whatever you name it, all right, good. But there are just some things, just some things that we can't depend on any human being for. We've just got to go to God. And we'll see here now in the next stage that he starts to understand that. So, but, but just again, you, you see that his perception is good. He knows he's blind, but it's partial in the sense that he'll just call on anybody. Anybody can help me. But for what he really most needs, only God can do it. And that leads us then to his second stage, which is that there's a perception of the problem, which is partial. But now we come to a proclamation that is prescribed for him. It says here in the text, and being told that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by, he said, oh, the great one, the, the one who is said to be the anointed of God, the healer. Oh, and he starts crying out, Jesus, son of David, have pity on me. And that, that, if you will, is what is prescribed for us. Go to your doctor, go to your lawyer. The Lord is blessing them to bless you. But at the end of the day, there are just going to be some things where you just have to cry out, Jesus. There is no other name under all heaven and earth by which we are to be saved than that of Jesus Christ. And our truest problems are not, well, we don't have enough money or we don't have enough health. Our biggest problem, only the Lord can help us with. I'm blind, pitiable, poor, and naked. That's what he said to the church of Laodicea, a very wealthy church, much like the church in America, very wealthy, very proud, and deeply flawed and in need of so much mercy from God. If only you knew, says the Lord, how blind, pitiable, poor, and naked you are. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 23 and following. I'm sorry, that's chapter 3. Okay, you follow me. So again, the only answer for this, cry out, Jesus, have mercy on me. Jesus, have pity on me. And not just me, but on the whole world. For the sake of your sorrowful passion, have mercy on me and on the whole world, Lord. Okay. So we see that there is this second stage he comes to. He knows he's blind. He just calls to anybody he can for help. But now he's getting more focused, to use a vision term. And he understands that my biggest problem only the Lord can handle. And I hear that the Lord is passing by. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Jesus, do not pass me by. 
And he calls and he calls. So we see that his vision is getting clearer, even if an inner vision. There's a perception of the problem, a proclamation. Then there comes a kind of a perseverance that is required, a perseverance. You see, what happened, it says here, the crowd began to rebuke him. Shut up. Stop being so loud. Stop talking. You're interrupting. He just kept crying all the louder, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Have pity on me. So the crowd tries to stop him. And it says, it implies that Jesus just keeps going, moving. Oh, eventually he'll stop and say, call him. But it takes a little time. Okay. So again, you'll have people in your life, as I will, who say, you know, you read that dusty old Bible. You pray those, you fumble those old beads. You're so superstitious. You're so old-fashioned. Come on. We have science. We have medicine. Follow the science. Listen to all this stuff about God and keep that out of the public square. Don't talk to children about those fantasies and those little myths that you all repeat. People talk like that. People think we're a little silly to spend time listening to a foolish old man up here in a pulpit. See, this is how the world can be. So we get some of that. But we also get, even from God, I've called, why aren't you answering? There's a delay. Eventually, Jesus stops and says, call him. But not right away. And what is this all about? Why does God delay? Many of us have needs that we think are very urgent. God, I, I need a new job quickly. Otherwise, I can't pay my bills. Lord, I, I, I need better health. I, I might die if you don't fix this. You know, we cry out to the Lord in great urgency. And he kind of delays. Not always, but it's a frequent issue, isn't it? Why does God delay? I don't know. <laughs> I, I know a little bit. But I, I don't know the whole picture, and that neither do you. I will tell you, as we'll see, that one of the reasons that God delays is that we're not always ready for what he's offering. You see, the problem is for most of us, this is our human condition, we want relief. We don't really want healing. We think we want healing, but we don't really want it. So I'll give you a quick example. It has nothing to do with me and my life, nothing at all. But you, a man goes to the doctor. And the doctor says, your blood pressure is running kind of high these days. Uh, okay, well, just give me a pill and let's get rid of it. And the doctor says, well, we can give you a pill, but what about lifestyle? How about, what are you, what are you eating? <laughs> In what quantities? <laughs> Maybe you should get a little more exercise. Oh, that's a lot of work. Just give me a pill. Give me a pill. Bring the blood pressure down. Give me a pill. Let's be done with it. And that's how we can be. We want relief, not healing. Healing takes guts. Healing takes courage. Healing involves real systemic changes in our life. Just give me a pill. Isn't there some medicine? Isn't there some quick thing you can do? Sometimes. Is that the best thing? I don't know. But you see what happens is we're in such a rush. We want quick relief. But God's in the healing business. And it takes time. It takes courage. And so one of the reasons that God often delays and why we need to persevere might be that God says, okay, I'm getting you ready. I'm getting you ready. But you're not ready yet. Jesus said before he went to heaven, just before he ascended, he said, there are many things I have to tell you, but you can't bear them now. But the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he'll, he'll lead you to the whole truth. <laughs> but not now. Your head would explode. You can't take it. You know, to quote an old movie, you can't, un you know, what is it? You can't take the truth. Okay. So it is that the Lord, some of his delay, whether we like to think about it this way or not, some of his delay, I don't say all of it, because there is a mysterious quality to his delay, but some of it, is because we are not ready for what he would need to do to resolve the issue. Sometimes people who are in financial troubles, well, there's an old saying among financial analysts, it's not what you earn, it's what you spend. 
Okay. That's lifestyle stuff. Just give me more money, Lord. Uh uh-uh. uh. It's what are you spending? See, okay. Now that leads us then to the next point. We come to the next stage of his journey. It is a, we, we've seen that he, he has this blindness. He finally gets focused on, I need to call Jesus. And then there needs to be some perseverance. He's, some people say, shut up, stop doing this. Other, uh, but the Lord also himself seems to delay. So we have to persevere. And God is getting us ready for something we can't handle right now. All right, that leads us then to a priority that's presented. It kind of illustrates something very important for us. You notice it says here, finally when Jesus says call him, it says he threw aside his cloak and sprang up and ran to Jesus. Now he must have had help, but you get the idea. He goes to him, but notice, don't miss this point. He threw aside his cloak. what's, What's the point of that? Some stupid sleeping bag, some blanket? Pay attention. This... For this man is probably the most precious and necessary thing in his life. We're in Jericho, it says. And Jericho is a deep rift valley. It's in a deep rift valley, 1,600 feet below sea level. And it gets very hot during the day. Much like Death Valley, it's very, you know, deep crevices in the earth heat up. And Jericho is very, very hot, 95, 100 degrees, not, not uncommon, even in the cooler months of the year. And, but at night, because there's no humidity, the temperature pew, drops. It could go down. It could be 90s during the day and drop all the way down to the lower 50s or the upper 40s. I remember being in Denver, which is not even clearly as big of a desert as Jericho, but I remember being there, and we spent the night that Pope John Paul was coming. And we spent the night lying there on the desert floor waiting, a million of us out there in that big open desert area. It was 95 degrees. We're putting all this lotion on for the sunburn. Nighttime came, 47 degrees, shivering. That's what deserts are like. Now, this man needs this cloak. It's probably necessary, the most necessary and important thing in his life. He throws it aside to go to Jesus. Nothing will hinder him. Now, what about us? There's a song in the hymn, you can look it up. Nothing between my soul and the Savior. There's nothing between. Liars. (laughs) I include myself. Sometimes we sing songs more in hope than in truth. Because frankly, if we're honest, there's a lot of things between my soul and the Savior. Maybe it's your favorite sin. Well, if I really wanted to get serious about this thing, I'd probably have to give it up. (laughs) Or it could be just something that's not sinful, but it's just too much. It's in the way. It clutters your life. It distracts you. But it's so hard to think about living without it. Hmm. If I were to downsize my life and make things more simple. Oh, I can't think. There's a lot of things between our soul and the Savior. Are we like this man? This blind man, Bartimaeus, are we able to cast it aside to go to the Lord? Well, God is so good to us. He knows we're not ready for a lot of things. And so that's why we're following this Bartimaeus and the stages of his journey. And the Lord knows we have stages. And that's why sometimes he delays and quickly running to our, I want to see. Well, uh, yeah, but if you do, there's going to be a lot of important things that will change in your life. Are you ready? Now, this man shows he's ready because he takes the most precious thing in his life and is willing to throw it aside for God to do the work he needs to do. All right. There comes next in his journey. See, he had to, there's a priority that's presented. We have to cast aside a lot of things. The finally, the second of finally, there are two more points. There is a permission that is procured. So Bartimaeus is finally standing before the Lord, and the Lord says, and ask him a very strange question. What do you want me to do for you? Can somebody say, duh? I mean, a blind man is standing before him, and he says, what, wait, listen, pay, pay attention. You see how respectful the Lord is of us? You see, what's going to happen to Bartimaeus is that if, his, if he starts to see, 
His life, although it's kind of pitiable, it's sad, but it's all he knows, jangling the cup, and people put coins in, and somehow he can feed himself. But now, if he gets his sight back, that's not tolerable. Come on, what's wrong with you sitting here jangling the cup? You're, you're able. Get up. Work. Do other things. You can't just sit here begging for, for this. You, you, you're no longer blind. You, now you can see. You need to get about and do what you ought to do. And so there come responsibilities if we're healed. It's not just like our life is just swell. Because it's swell, but now I have other things that I have to go about. I can no longer sit and make excuses. So the Lord asked, what do you want me to do for you? What are you ready for? I remember one time I told you this story. I think I was a seminarian. I was, uh, at that time, I hadn't actually entered the seminary yet, but I was choir director and organist over at Old St. Mary's down at Fifth and H in Chinatown. And I was locking up the church after choir rehearsal, and I thought to myself, I went before the Sacred Heart statue, and I said, Lord, I want to go to the seminary. Make me a holy priest. Now, I'm not used to seeing things, y'all, but I'm going to tell you right now, that Sacred Heart statue looked at me and winked. He winked at me. As if to say, you don't know what you're asking, man. Do you understand how hard it is to make you holy? <laughs> do you understand what has to change in you? You're not ready, man. I tell you what, let's just do this thing incrementally. Let's get you to the seminary and see if you make it through that. Okay, you see the idea? We, we don't always know what we're asking. And so the Lord says, are you sure? Are you really ready? So he, there's a permission that's procured. And we come then to the final stage. Isn't it beautiful? The blind man, Bartimaeus, says, I want to see. And by now the Lord knows he's ready. He's cast aside his garment. He's gone to the Lord. He's been crying out. And the Lord says, he's now ready. And he heals him. And that finally then leads us to this final stage of his journey in this particular area. Namely this. There's a path that he follows. It says, Jesus says, okay, go your way. Your faith has saved you. Well, what is his way? Where do I go? What do I do? Simple enough. I am the way. It says here, immediately Bartimaeus received his sight and followed Jesus on the way. In other words, as if to say, look, my whole life has changed now. I can't sit here begging, jangling the cup. I've got a different way I have to walk. Now I follow the Lord. And wherever he leads, I will follow. By the way, that is not as easy as it sounds. Jesus doesn't always agree with you. Jesus doesn't always take the turn you think he should take. Well, Lord, that's a quicker route this way. But like GPS, he knows there's a traffic jam over there. Jesus has GPS before there was GPS. <laughs> it's not always easy because we're prideful, we're stubborn, we think we know better. So you see, he's, but he's following Jesus along the way. And for you and me, this is our path. So we start with a man who's blind. At least he knows he's blind. But he still only partially perceives. Anyone can help me. No, only one can help you. He focuses. He calls on Jesus. He perseveres. And then the Lord finally says, what do you want me to do? Are you ready? Having cast aside his cloak, he says, yes, I'm finally ready. And the Lord gives him what he needs and is ready for. So if God is delaying in your life, you might say, don't just blame God. You might say, hmm, is there something between my soul and the Savior? Does he know better? If he were to answer my prayer, could I really take it? Be very careful. We think we see everything. We don't. And the Lord has to lead us carefully through these stages in our life. I have it on the best of authority that as he started to follow the Lord, he was singing a, a fairly new song. It's in the hymnal. You can look it up. It just says, I want to walk, he sang as he followed Jesus. I want to walk as a child of the light. I want to follow Jesus. 
God set the stars to give light to the world, but the star of my life is Jesus. In him, there is no darkness at all. The night and the day are both alike. And the lamb, the light of the, the lamb is the light of the whole city of God. Shine in my heart, Lord Jesus. And so for us, that's a beautiful prayer. But are you ready for it? Somebody just says, somebody just say with me, ready as I can be. Help me, Lord, to get more ready. <laughs> oh, Lord, do what you need to do. Amen.